Did you know Daki might have just been Gyutaro's imaginary friend? Guys, Demon Slayer may have already ended, but do we really know the full context of this story? Here are the theories that may have actually turned out to be true. Alright, so how was Nezuko able to conquer the sun? And not just her, but also when Tanjiro was turned into a demon, he too was able to walk under the sun. Tanjiro's mother always knew where to find the blue spider lilies and show Tanjiro as a kid. His family had always been poor, with so many mouths to feed, it does make sense sense that they would take nearby herbs and flowers to make tea during those times. The theory goes she made blue spider lily tea for them to drink, which explains why Nezuko and Tanjiro managed to become immune to the sun despite becoming demons. You can argue that they were immune because of Hinokami Kagura, the sun breathing, but we never see Nezuko perform the dance or sun breathing movements. So this means that the common factor between them both becoming immune to the sun has to be something else. Well, there is every reason to believe that it was the blue spider Lily. This also makes the entire story kind of ironic because if Muzon had just consumed Nezuko when he attacked the household, he would have achieved his dream of conquering the sun. Next is the truth about our favorite demon duo, Daki and Gyutaro. One thing that's impossible to ignore is the way Gyutaro hides his ugly existence behind Daki's beauty, both literally and metaphorically. What would you say to the idea that Gyutaro's sister had truly already gone to the other side, and Daki was just a flesh puppet he created? to cope. A theory was born that said it was only Gyutaro all along. Daki was a result of his unprocessed grief. As a protective brother whose life revolved around her, Gyutaro dearly missed Daki. He'd do anything to get her back, even if it's just a replica of her, a copy he created using his flesh manipulation. So realistic that he maybe even fooled himself into thinking that he never lost his sister. And in case it's actually true, the Entertainment District arc just became twice as emotionally devastating. Let's talk about those infamous Demon Slayer marks. Kokushibo said that those who awaken the Demon Slayer mark die before the age of 25. Yorichi is an exception to this rule because even though Kokushibo knew that his brother lived to be 80 years old, he still continued spreading fake news about the marks. It's more likely that the Slayers died not because of something stupid like a curse, but because of the physical repercussions of using the mark. We know that the mark requires a heart rate of 200 beats per minute and a body temperature of 39 degrees. Now, such a physical state is neither healthy nor sustainable, which is why the Slayers of the past would burn themselves out and die before reaching the age of 25. Kinda like how Olympians tend to have a shorter lifespan due to the way they train. Plus, the lifespan of people back in that era was was much shorter than modern days anyways. Hopefully this is the case because we all want Giyu and Sanami, our boys, to live a long and peaceful life. And what about this one? The Demon Slayer marks can only be triggered by sun-breathing users. The marks weren't a thing until Yorichi was born, and then when he started training other Demon Slayers, the marks also started appearing on them. It wasn't until a Sun Breather activated his own mark that others are able to start doing it too. Heck, the story itself said that when a mark appears on someone, it will also appear on others as if in resonance. What if it can only be Sun Breathing users in specific that trigger this resonance? After all, in Chapter 128, Amine mentioned the Sengoku era, which was Yorichi's time period when she explained the marks. It's an indirect way to say that the marks didn't appear again until the current time period, and the one who brought them back is, of course, Tanjiro. Since none of the Hashira had heard anything about them, it's clear that only the two generations which had an active Sun Breathing user produced Demon Slayer marks. Now, why aren't we talking about Tanjiro's dad in all of this? He also had a mark. It's because Tanjiro's family were never demon slayers. His father never joined the core. Have you heard about the left versus right theory? I think most have, but there's a hidden detail at the end of the manga that may have confirmed the fate of one beloved character. In Mugen Train Arc's opening, there's a theory that suggests those characters who are facing left survives their battles, and those who are facing right are the ones who dies. Well, we see what happens with Rengoku. Then in the Entertainment District arc opening, the same pattern happens again with both Tangan and Tanjiro facing the left. They both survive, but Tangan's left arm is facing the right, and that's the hand he loses in battle with Gyutaro. Now part two, in chapter 204 of the manga, we see Genya, Shinobu, Rengoku, and the other Hashiras on the left side. They're all the dead characters. Tanjiro and Nezuko is safely on the right, but looking towards the left. There's a sneaky character that's hiding behind all of them with their face hidden and walking towards the right. This looks like Lady Tamayo. 
Now, there's a lot of interpretation. Some say the ones facing the left are the ones who get to be reincarnated, whereas Lady Tamayo never gets to reincarnate given she did some bad deeds during her time with Muzan. This is pretty depressing given Lady Tamayo played an important role in defeating Muzan and was always shown to us as one of the good guys. Also, in the fan book, Yushiro asked to be husband and wife with Tamayo if they ever get reincarnated, to which she agreed. Does that mean they never get to be together? Next, we have reason to believe that all demons turn back into humans when they die. Once you become a demon, you don't remember your past human memories. Now you may be thinking, but Gyutaro remembered everything about his backstory. Personally, I think demons who were willingly turned into demons like Gyutaro and Doma, they do remember their human lives. Whereas those turned against their will like Akaza doesn't remember. Luzon is blood linked with all his demon subjects and it doesn't seem like he gets his powers back when the demons die. You know how Tanjiro has been preaching and touching demons' hearts with his protagonist warmth, making them repent when he kills them. They all end up remembering their human lives when they die, and that's how they turn back into a human and thus not dying as a demon. Muzan doesn't get the powers that he shared back. On the topic of Muzan, let's talk about his illegal corporate practices. Like, what kind of employer just kills and eats his employees? Are there no labor laws in Demon Slayer? He treated them as if they were expendable. But what if that was always the intention? Luzon is considerably attentive towards the upper moons, and whereas his treatment towards the lower moons was rather questionable. He never needed to look for food because he had his own food farm, basically the lower moons. He killed and consumed them because they had already eaten a lot of humans and it's easier than hunting humans on his own. It's likely that this wasn't the first time he consumed most of the lower moon, because we know they are much, much younger than the upper moon. The turnover rate is insane and there's no HR around. And speaking of organizations, what about the origins of the Demon Slayer Corps? Everybody knows that the Demon Slayer Corps is just a private organization. It's funded by the Ubayashiki family, and it's been that way for a thousand years. But why did an elite family from the Heian era create such an organization in the first place? You have to keep in mind that every time a final selection takes place, a number of innocent children perish. Also, before Yorichi entered the chat, the Demon Slayers would fight demons like normal people, without breaths. And so the mortality rate must have been astronomical. What does this all mean? Well, what if they were never this noble organization that we all thought? Their mission wasn't to eradicate demons and save humanity, but simply to produce the best fighters who can kill Muzan and break their own family curse at all costs. Moving on, we have our boy Zenitsu's Thunder Breathing. Now, one thing we have to understand is that the breathing techniques aren't actually the elements. For example, Rengoku didn't summon flames. His swordsmanship was based on how flames move. However, there is an exception. You see, when it comes to Thunder Breathing, the user mimics lightning so well that they cause the air to vibrate and just like that, they also create sound like thunder with their footsteps. Well, this is where we'll insert a theory. Remember how Zenitsu was literally hit by a lightning bolt in his flashback? He survived, and he also just so happens to be a thunder breather? What if that's not a coincidence and thunder breathers needs to be hit by thunder to unlock the full potential of this breathing? He literally was the chosen one.